Hi guys, and welcome to the final video in this series on making a 3D endless runner in Unity. In this video, we'll be adding some finishing touches to our project and learning best practices when coding in Unity. Before we get started, don't forget to hit like and subscribe and ring the bell so you don't miss another video. Without further ado, let's get started. The first thing we're going to do is change some of our variables from public to be serialized field. The difference between these two modifiers are that public allows the variable to be accessed from the inspector and from other scripts, while serialized field only allows the variable to be accessed from the inspector and not other scripts. Although a public modifier does work for our purposes, it's generally accepted to use a serialized field modifier in cases where you don't need to access a variable from other scripts. Although it isn't really necessary in a small project like this, when you start making bigger scripts with 20 to 30 variables, or sometimes even more, readability is extremely important. Readability just means how easy it is to read and understand code, and knowing what variables are accessed from other scripts, and what variables are not accessed from other scripts, is an extremely important part of it. To get started, let's head over to the scripts folder in our project, hit Ctrl A to select all of them, and then hit Enter to open them up in Visual Studio. The first script that I'm going to edit is the player movement. If you want to, you can use Ctrl F to search for variables and see whether they are used in other scripts by selecting this drop down and choosing the current project. This will look for this variable across all scripts. However, I know that the rigid body RB and horizontal multiplier are the only ones which aren't used in other scripts. With that in mind, for each of these, I'm going to replace the public with a square bracket and inside it serialize field. Next, I'll go to the game manager script. The only variable we need to change here is the score text. So replace the public again with serialize field. I'll go into the coin script and do the same with the turn speed, so public to serialize field. Then I'll go to the ground tile and change the obstacle prefab down here to be serialized field as well, as well as the coin prefab. Another good practice is to keep your variables at the top of your script, which again improves the readability of the code. Because of this, Let's use Ctrl X without selecting anything to cut the line, then scroll up to the top and paste it in there. I'll do the same with the obstacle prefab. I'm also going to delete the update function as it's currently empty. We're nearly done with this, so let's go to the ground spawner and change the ground tile prefab to be serialized field. And finally, the camera follow script and change the player to be a serialized field. Great, the next thing that we're going to do is a little bit more useful, and that's going to be making it so that the first few tiles can't spawn an obstacle. Currently, if I go back to the editor and press play, there is a decent chance that the first tile will spawn an obstacle right in the middle, as you just saw, which is unavoidable for the player. To fix this, Let's go to the ground tile script, and in front of the spawn obstacle function, I'm going to add public. This means that the function will be able to be called from another script. I will also do the same with the spawn coins function, so public void spawn coins. Next, I'll go to the start function and remove these functions from the start, meaning that we will not call these functions by default when a ground tile is spawned. I'll head over to the ground spawner script and inside it find the spawn tile function. In the parentheses I'm going to add an input which will be type of boolean, so bool which is true or false, and it will be called spawn items. This makes an input to the function, meaning that whenever we call the function we have to tell it whether to spawn items on the tile or not. At the bottom of the function, so I'll just make some space here and type if, then press tab twice to insert the snippet and spawn items, then T 
10th, which is the game object reference to the ground tile that we spawned up here. So temp dot get component ground tile, which gets a reference to this script. And then in here, we can say dot spawn obstacle to call the spawn obstacle function that we made public. Below that, I will also say temp dot get component ground tile dot spawn coins to call the spawn coins function. As you can see, this makes it easy for us to decide whether we want to spawn items on the tile or not. In the start function, you'll see that we're receiving an error when we call the spawn tile function. This is because we just said that the function must take a boolean input, but we aren't giving it one. To solve this, we could simply put true in the parentheses, meaning that these tiles will all be spawned with items. However, that means that the first few tiles would still be spawning obstacles on them, and we wouldn't have solved anything. To solve this, we could use some kind of counting variable, something that increases by 1 each time this loop runs, and then check if that counter is more than or equal to something before spawning the tiles. Essentially, what this means is once a certain number of tiles have been spawned, we will start spawning items. Luckily for us, this counter already exists, and that counter is i. You can see this in the declaration of the for loop. What the for loop does in these parentheses is it declares a variable called i to be 0, and will keep on running the loop while i is less than 15. Every time the loop runs, i will increase by 1. So the first time i will be 0, then it will go to 1, then 2, and all the way up to 14. With that in mind, inside this for loop, we can now say if i is less than 3, then spawn tile false, meaning that the first three tiles spawned will not spawn items on them. After that, we can say else spawn tile true, and I'll delete the spawn tile at the bottom. So what this means is the first three times the function runs, it will call spawn tile with false as an input, so this will not run, and it will not spawn any items on it. However, after the first three tiles, it will call it with an input of true, and this code will run, meaning that the tiles will spawn items on them. Finally, if we go back to the ground tile script, you'll see I'm receiving another error here. We are calling spawn tile, but again, we haven't given it any input. The fix for this one will be quite simple, as we just have to say true. If we return back to the editor now, we can hit play to test it out. You'll see that the first three tiles spawn with no items, and after that, things spawn as usual. If I die and the game restarts, it all still works. The last thing that I want to cover in this tutorial is making the players speed up as they gain more points to make it more interesting. This is pretty simple, so let's go to the player movement script and add a new variable. This will be public float speed increase per point, and I'll set that by default to be 0 0.1. In the game manager, we keep track of the player's score and have a function for whenever the player's score increases. In this function, we want to increase the player's speed depending on the variable that we just created. To do this, we'll need another variable which will be serialize field player movement and I'll call this player movement with a lowercase p. Now inside the increment score function, I'll say player movement dot speed plus equals player movement dot speed increase per point. Remember, the plus equals sign means to add to the current value so the player's speed will increase by the increase per point. I'll also scroll up and remove the public from the score variable, as the score variable is not used in any other scripts. Back in the editor, I'm going to select the game manager and drag and drop the player into the player movement slot. 
This will assign the player movement component of the player to that variable. Finally, before hitting play, I'll go to the player, scroll down to the player movement, and increase the speed increase per point to something like 0 0.5, just so that you can see it a bit better when I demonstrate. Now, I'll hit play. You can see that as I'm collecting coins, the player is speeding up quite a lot as I have increased the speed increase per point to a very high number. You can adjust this number to whatever you want to. That's the end of the tutorial, but I have a little announcement. I've been thinking about changing my content to devlogs of the game that I am working on rather than tutorials, as with time constraint from school and extracurricular activities, I simply don't have enough time to do both tutorials and work on my game. Drop a comment below. Would you rather I continue making tutorials, or would you be interested to see the progress that I'm making with my game? Also, if you want me to keep making tutorials, drop another comment about what tutorial you would like to see next. I probably won't be doing full follow-along series, but feel free to suggest anything, and I'll see what seems feasible with my schedule in mind. Thanks for all the support you've given me throughout this series. It really means a lot to me. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.